Hello! Today I'm returning to some discussion on Final Fantasy VIII by taking a look at the hero and somewhat divisive character of Squall Leonhardt. Returning viewers will know I've discussed Final Fantasy VIII at length before, but in light of the game being remastered and given some much-deserved attention, I feel now is as good a time as any to return to this world and characters, reiterating some points I made a few years ago, and also discussing them in a little more depth. Now, Squall is an interesting one, because in many ways he continued the Squaresoft trend of the latter 1990s as a troubled hero perpetually on the cusp of an existential meltdown, such as Terra in Final Fantasy VI, and most famously Cloud Strife in Final Fantasy VII. However, Squall's particular brand of coming-of-age indecision and aloofness, prompting his gradual transition into trust and adulthood, which is forced upon him by Renoa, Sid, and external events, made his character arc among the most beautifully paced stories to unfold in a Final Fantasy to date, I think, and secondary elements such as the Laguna story operating on a dual timeline, but so intrinsically linked with Squall and contemporary events, just made the wider game story among the best I've ever experienced, from a narrative perspective. But looking at Squall specifically now, I think it's worthwhile to begin discussing what distinguishes him from other Final Fantasy heroes, with particular regard to Cloud Strife, with whom he is often somewhat controversially compared, and more recently Noctis from 15, who likewise he shares some traits with, but differs in some quite significant ways, I think. With regards to the former, being the immediate successor to Cloud was always going to prove an uphill struggle for Squall, particularly as he continued the trend of a complex, aloof, and somewhat traumatised hero who spends much of the game trying to reconcile with the past. However, this broad arc owes more to Square's writers shifting away from ensemble party stories, and focusing on single heroes with existential dilemmas at the time, with Xenogears being another prominent example. So rather than a conscious carbon copying of Seven's popular hero Cloud, which many have asserted, I think this is an opinion that takes Cloud and Squall only at face value, rather than delving into their respective characters and actually looking at the respective stories here. For Cloud's part, his story and trauma hinges around this theme of identity, we meet him as a facsimile of Zack Fair, living out the hopes and dreams of his former comrade, owing to Mako poisoning and trauma. And throughout the game, Cloud by turns considers himself a soldier first class, a puppet, a Sephiroth clone, until finally Tifa helps him regain some semblance of self. Squall, on the other hand, has trauma rooted in childhood abandonment and trust issues, which I'll touch on in depth shortly, and his story arc broadly consists of learning to open up to others, which is explored through the theme of love, while at the same time, in tandem, he has this sort of coming of age, you know, adapting into adulthood and, and, ultimately, and ultimately a leadership capacity going on as well. Turning to Noctis, many consider him similar to Squall, because he comes across as a tragic hero with a small support network of friends around him. But once again, his origins, character arc, and anxieties are for entirely different reasons, and explore actually quite opposing themes to Squall. Noctis is a prince within the Lucian dynasty, and early conversations with King Regis indicate that he's always been destined to do his sacred duty, become king, accept responsibilities, and as we later see, make some quite significant sacrifices too. So Noctis's anxiety stems from these weighty expectations, and the fact that his life has been narrowed down to this predetermined path from which there is no diversion. Almost every major decision in this game is out of his hands, right down to his proposal to Lady Luna Freya, which is a marriage of political convenience rather than one that's born specifically out of love, romance, or personal choice. Turning to Squall, most of his angst stems for quite the opposite reason, and as he evolves into a position of leadership, it is the chaos of existential freedom that has him perpetually on edge. As Sartre famously wrote, man is condemned to be free, and contrary to the single road Noctis walks, Squall has to grapple with every branching indecision, considering the outcome of events and whether he's doing the right thing. Key game segments involving player input explore this, such as deciding on the party in major game moments, and prioritising orders during the Battle of the Gardens, for example, where we can choose to attack, defend, look after the junior classmen, and of course protect the hot dogs. Where political powers determine Noctis's marriage proposal, again, by comparison, Squall's relationship to Renoa is prompted by a chance encounter and organically grows into a potent love over the course of the game, 
which also marks the dramatic shift of Squall's isolated introversion to one of romantic selflessness. Moving on, I feel Squall is an excellent Final Fantasy hero to consider, not just owing to the aforementioned dilemma that he finds himself in, but also the aesthetic symbolism that's bound up to his character, from his name and attire, right through to the trademark weapon he wields, all of which I think holds more thematic weight than any Final Fantasy protagonist we've seen before. For example, starting with his weapon, I've previously stated how the hero's weapon is almost as significant as as the hero themselves in a lot of ways. It says something about their status and the world that they're operating in. And we only need to look at lightsabers in Star Wars, Valyrian weapons in Game of Thrones, going all the way back to Excalibur in Arthurian legend, to know that certain weapons, which are usually swords, indicate a certain significance and worthiness to the hero character. Cloud's Buster Sword was a tough one to succeed, because it's symbolic of Zack's legacy being handed down to him, and also Cloud's muddled perception of himself early on. Plus the fact, from a purely aesthetic point of view, it was immediately cool and iconic looking. Turning to the Gunblade, however, I always found it to have a subtle brilliance about the way it reflected the world and setting we were operating in, because Final Fantasy VIII was a modern, futuristic fantasy featuring trains, space travel, and technologically driven societies such as Esther, but it also featured more archaic feudalism from ages past, such as sorceresses, knights, and magic. So blending a sword with a gun seems like the perfect analogue for a world which merges these aspects of old and new. The gunblade being a somewhat scarce and specialist weapon also indicates the significance of Squall as hero, but uniquely as well highlights the rivalry and intrinsic connection with Cypher, who I will discuss more thoroughly in a dedicated episode, but I think is worth touching on briefly since a lot of the symbolism in Squall can be reflected in the opposing characteristics of Cypher, which was a really interesting aspect of the game, I think. Now, Cypher and Squall are brilliant because, despite their mutual animosity, they are essentially two sides of the same coin. Everything from the mirrored scars on their forehead, to their gunblade aptitudes, their desire to succeed, and their origins as orphans, are uniquely similar. However, it is some fundamental differences in their respective personalities, with one being a quiet pragmatist who follows the rules, and the other being an impulsive upstart who goes his own way, being what divides them. Returning to aesthetics, the attire of Squall and Cypher exemplified this divide between them, where Squall was dressed in black and Cypher's dressed in white, and I've previously gone further to suggest that much like the symbolism of karate rankings, where a white belt denotes someone that's quite distant from mastery, and black denoting someone who has achieved mastery and moved into this leadership capacity, the colour psychology here sort of nods somewhat towards the respective personalities of Squall and Cypher, I think. Finally, an aspect of symbolism I really loved between these two, which really drives home the contrast between them, is that where Squall's name is etymologically bound to the element of water, because of course a squall is a storm at sea, Cypher is bound up with the opposing element of fire, as seen by him using fire magic all throughout the game, and even his limit break is called Fire Cross, for example. This subtle symbolism marks the binary opposition between them, and what propels it forward even further and shows it was a conscious thematic decision on the part of Square, is that Cypher's best friends, Rajin and Fujin, are named after the thunder and wind gods of Shinto mythology, so we subtly have these four core elements at work in the game, with Squall, as a loner and an introvert, being opposed to the three remaining elements. Another, perhaps more obvious symbolism of Squall's name is that it leans towards the unspoken acknowledgement that Laguna is his father and Rain is his mother, Laguna is the etymological root word of lagoon, which is an isolated body of water, which is in keeping with this water element associated with Squall, and perhaps signifies Laguna's chronological and geographical isolation from the main events of the game. And we also have, of course, rain, which is a word for precipitation, you know, rain falling from the sky. So once again, it ties Squall and Laguna together through the element of water, and I think the symbolism here with this water naming convention is just a remarkably subtle and effective means of, you know, conveying this subplot. And I really enjoyed it when I first started considering the characters of this game. Now, moving on to consider Squall's role and development within the story, he undergoes a remarkable transformation as events unfold, 
and it hinges around these ideas of trust and leadership I mentioned earlier. When we meet Squall at the beginning of the game, following his turbulent showdown with Cypher, he alternates between sullen silence and saying whatever. He's not immediately charismatic or objectively likeable, and indeed several Final Fantasy fans dislike Squall to this day, owing to this early persona. But it's prudent to mention that Squall is supposed to be this extreme in his emotional isolation and reluctance with other people, because it allows the theme of trust and leadership and coming of age to be explored that much more. For example, early in the game we see Squall as an extremely stoic yet competent student who plays by the rules. He doesn't warm up to Zell's optimism, he's reluctant to follow Cypher's wayward orders during the Dole mission, and he's dismayed by the Timber Owl's lack of professionalism while planning the train hijacking during the Timber mission. He's a pragmatist and a soldier, and while he's quietly insecure, he keeps it to himself, and only the player is offered insight through his thoughts, you know, which are displayed to us. So, fast forwarding to disc 3, we see Squall, who was formerly this stoic professional student, disregarding all semblance of logic, order, and common sense by kidnapping the comatose Renoa, and trying to take her on foot all the way to Esther to save her. Likewise, around the same time, we first hear mention of Ultimicia at Adia's orphanage, and while we're getting this dramatic plot twist of the primary antagonist delivered to us, Squall's thoughts are elsewhere entirely, and the inner monologue shows us that this guy, who was formerly the utmost professional, is ignoring this mission briefing because he's preoccupied by his concern for Renoa. So once again, it's this dramatic shift in his personality and his character arc where he becomes openly caring and concerned for others, which is a million miles away from this sullen, repressed teenager we meet on the hospital bed at the beginning of the game. So where some people have mentioned to me that they gave up you know, around disc two because they couldn't get into Squall, I think that's unfortunate because I feel his arc really come, came to fruition you know, and fully matures at around disc three. And I personally feel that the pacing and the payoff is worth it here, particularly working in conjunction with that fantastic Laguna story as well. Now, before I move on to the psychology of Squall, one thing I liked about his emotional transition is this brief glimmer of Cypher that we see in him, which once again goes back to this idea of how remarkably similar they are. And it's subtly delivered in a single line of dialogue that's quite easy to overlook, but it aptly conveys the weight of emotion that he's feeling at this time. Cypher's story arc hinges on this desire to be a sorceress's knight, and in the name of that dream, um, and the defence of a deer, he becomes a pretty ruthless guy, partaking in some pretty dramatic actions, such as commanding an attack on his former school. While Squall is in the midst of trying to save sorceress Renoa, he states that he'll become her knight if he has to, which leans to this idea that he's broken entirely with the isolated personality of the early game, and has given himself entirely to another person, even if it means conducting some pretty dubious acts to defend her. So let's shift focus now and briefly consider this psychological disposition of Squall. As I mentioned in my original Final Fantasy VIII review, fans that dislike him often regard him as an emo, which is a somewhat outdated, often derogatory term, hinting that he's got a depressive, self-depreciating, and dare I say it, whiny attitude. It's prudent to note here that Squall is not a whiny, depressed person, and if you consider his conduct during missions and during game events, he's actually remarkably pragmatic and professional, if a little indecisive at times, which owes to his transition into leadership and adulthood. The whole emo thing is a result of teenage angst and formative issues being packaged and commodified as an alternative music and lifestyle scene in the mid-2000s, And regrettably, as a result, anything that remotely touches on formative adolescent issues or attitudes, no matter how sincerely, has detractors screaming emo at it as loudly as possible. So Squall, as a teenager going through some formative experiences, which personally I think make him quite relatable and realistic and and interestingly human, is regrettably often targeted for this. And indeed, as Cypher once said, I've got a chicken wuss and a guy who just hit puberty in my squad. So let's take a step back and consider what's actually going on with Squall, and regarding his sullen demeanour, rather than a narcissism or pretentiousness or depression, his reluctance to emote with others actually stems from some quite acute childhood abandonment issues, and to this end, the character of Alone 
and the intermittent flashbacks of the child squall, who's you know, stood outside in the rain, pining after big Sis, are incredibly important scenes, because these are the roots from which his reluctance to open up to others stems. In my original Final Fantasy VIII review, I mentioned the psychological disposition of defensive detachment, which was theorised by the British psychologist John Bowlby, and I think is quite an accurate description for how Squall appears at the beginning of the game. Now, Bowlby argued that deprivation, trauma, and perceived abandonment during, during childhood, particularly from a maternal figure, which alone clearly is for Squall, can result in a child developing antisocial attributes, and specifically emotionally distancing themselves from others, so as to never again risk the emotional trauma of abandonment. We can see this in Squall, as his inner monologues often express opinions that you can only rely on yourself, and everyone eventually leaves, and so on, and it's interesting how, towards the end of the game, his deepest fears are in fact realised. After he finally opens up to Renoa and befriends all of his comrades, he's thrust into the void, where his child insecurities manifest once more. So, looked at this way, we can appreciate that he's not rude to Zell, Quistis, or Renoa early on because he dislikes them, but rather he's reluctant to forge any meaningful attachment to them because he assumes that much like Big Sis all those years ago, they will eventually leave him and he's going to end up all alone. And this is why Renoa is such a potent force and pivotal character in the game story, because the romance fostered there is what finally prompts this semblance of change in Squall. So as a result, I think it's important to acknowledge Squall's personality is a result of past experience, and how this game ties everything neatly together in terms of character and story. Those flashbacks at the orphanage aren't random additions to the game. The Laguna dreams aren't pointless diversions to make up for some lull in the action. Everything in Final Fantasy VIII is considered and a concerted effort to drive forward certain themes and ideas in certain characters, which, once again, I've discussed at length in my long-form review of the game. Now, I'm going to start wrapping up on this Squall discussion now, but I think it's, it's worth noting the infamous Squall is Dead theory, and also his aesthetic development over the years, culminating in the Final Fantasy VIII remaster. Uh, firstly, I enjoyed the thought and the effort put into the Squall is Dead theory, and find it generally quite an amusing idea, but I dismiss it as a genuine plot device, because of course it undermines the character growth between Squall, Renoa, and the wider party, and what is really quite a natural and optimistic conclusion for this game. And, you know, in my opinion, the game is actually a reflection and a celebration of love, both platonic and romantic, and I think it's epitomised brilliantly in the home movie FMV sequence that we see during the credit roll of the game. Now, regarding the Final Fantasy VIII remaster and Squall's aesthetic development over time, I will prefix by saying that I remember first seeing the concept art and the demo gameplay showcased for Final Fantasy VIII back in 1998-1999, and off the back of the boxy, super-deformed field aesthetics and the more anime art style of Final Fantasy VII, I was really excited by the step forward towards figurative realism that Tetsuya Nomura had moved towards here, and I am regrettably swung by the bias of nostalgia here when it comes to Final Fantasy VIII. That said, Squall's slightly more cartoonish redesign in Kingdom Hearts was great because it fits perfectly with the Disney-esque world and setting of that game, and his appearances in Dissidia again unify with the world and setting that's crafted there. So, turning to the remaster, it's interesting to consider how, rather than this mature, figurative approach to Final Fantasy VIII, which you know it was originally renowned for, they've opted for a slightly more cartoonish, rounded, almost anime-leaning with Squall's art design, while at the same time they maintain the realistic FMV sequences, which, on the surface at least, is somewhat jarring. And returning to this idea of Squall's character being flawed and human and relatable, picturing him during these troubled story scenarios, such as you know, lying on his dorm room bed, grappling with his insecurities, or going crazy and busting Renoa out of her captivity, it feels like it could lose some of that potency with this renewed art direction, which is a bit more optimistic and cartoony. But that is merely my opinion, and I could be very wrong, and I guess it remains to be seen. So, anyway, that about wraps up my thoughts on Squall. If you're into Final Fantasy VIII and would like to hear my extended thoughts on the game, please check out my Final Fantasy VIII review, which is available on the channel, and I'll link to it in the description.
And as always, feel free to drop a comment and start a conversation. Hit like and hit subscribe to keep updated with my latest posts.